I want to first thank our generous sponsors because without them, this would not be possible. Well, I hope you have enjoyed our day today. We had the panel earlier today. And if you were unable to attend the panel, you can always check it out on our YouTube page where all of our events from today and the rest of Black Neuro Week will be available. Additionally, if you want to share any highlights from today and this week, please do so using the hashtag, hashtag BINW22. Before we begin this next event, I would like to acknowledge that I am joining you today from the land of the Lenape, now recognized as Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. We are all joining this event from different places around the world. And so I invite you to take a moment to reflect on the lands you are joining from, as well as your relationship to those lands and to the indigenous peoples who have and continue to inhabit them. It is my pleasure to introduce you to this today's keynote speaker, Dr. Marguerite Ritter. Dr. Marguerite Ritter obtained a Bachelor of Science and Master's of Science in Biomedical Sciences at the Faculty of Earth and Life Sciences of the VU University in Amsterdam, the Netherlands, after which Dr. Ritter continued studying to obtain her PhD from the VU Medical Center in Amsterdam. Her PhD focused on the hereditary childhood brain disorder, megalocephalic leukoencephalopathy, <laughs> which focused on the hereditary childhood, oh, oops, synopathy with subcortical cysts, sorry. Two shared first author papers from this time were published in the journals Brain and the American Journal of Human Genetics. Currently, Dr. Ritter is a postdoctoral research fellow at the Queensland Brain Institute in the Synaptic Plasticity Lab of Professor Pankaj Sa, where she is using light and drug activated receptors in mice to disentangle movement related neural circuits and utilizing chemogenetics as potential therapeutic interventions in MND mouse models. Today, we will have the opportunity to hear more about this wonderful work that Dr. Ritter is doing and experience of researching in Australia. If you have any questions, you may use the Q&A function. But in the meantime, please join me in welcoming Dr. Ritter. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry I did that to you, Kendall. It took me about an entire PhD to learn how to pronounce mechaencephalic leukoencephalopathy with subcortical cyst. I should not have put that in the title. That was ridiculous. Thank you everyone for being here. And I'm really looking forward to basically sharing my journey with you. So the title of my talk is Discovering Meaningful Connections. And, you know, throughout our lives, we discover many meaningful connections through um, with other people and our communities. And I am so grateful that I discovered this community. I'm so happy that uh, the Black and Neuro community reached out to me. And, you know, being connected to other people is really one of our human basic needs. And through connections with each other, you know, when in science, but also without science, we've been able to basically co-create and co-discover some amazing things. Of course, I'm here to mainly talk about the connections in the brain, mainly synaptic connections. Uh, but before I start, I really want to acknowledge the people who have an historic connection to this land. Acknowledgement of country. I acknowledge the Turbal and Jaguar people as the traditional owners and custodians of the lands from which I am speaking to you today. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connection to country. We recognize their valuable contribution to Australia and global society. So long before this university was built, I'm in the boardroom of the Queensland Brain Institute right now, there were people on these lands and they were teaching and they were learning and they were researching. And what followed was dispossession and colonization and the disparity we see today uh, between indigenous and non-indigenous Australia comes back to what was done to them and they deserve better. And one of the reasons we are here, it's because we know that there's still a lot of work to be done to make our societies and institutions more just, equitable and inclusive for all. 
we're also here, of course, to share our fascination and our knowledge about the brain. So I'm sure there's a wide range of um, neuroscientists joining today, cell biologists, geneticists. So as the title suggests, I'm an electrophysiologist, and I'm really excited about the electrical signals that neurons use to communicate with each other. So here you just see a picture of two neurons connected through a synapse where an action potential in one neuron releases neurotransmitters. Now these neurotransmitters can bind to ionotronic receptors. And when they bind, they open a pore and this pore will allow the flow of ions which ch changes the potential um, of the receiving neurons which could allow this neuron to fire action potentials again. Around the time I was born, these two men developed this really amazing technique that allows you to record these electrical signals. It's called the patch clamp technique from which they won, for which they won the Nobel Prize in 1991. And you can measure up to one pico amps. You can as little as one pico amps of current, which is tiny. So you can measure using a very sensitive amplifier, ions flowing through single ion channels. You can also use a whole cell configuration where you suck out this little bit of membrane and then you have access to the entire cell, which are called whole cell recordings. Um, and this allows you to basically listen to all the inputs that a single neuron is receiving. It also allows you to look at the intrinsic firing properties. So we know that different neurons have different morphologies, but they also have really individual uh, patterns of firing these different groups of neurons. Um, and what you can do is you can record from two neurons at the same time, and you can evoke action potentials in one and figure out what neurotransmitters they release and how they communicate with the receiving neuron. So really this uh, technique allows you to record from single channels to whole cell conductance, where you look at local synaptic connectivity and firing properties. Um, and then more recently, the field of optogenetics was born where a light sensitive channel was developed. And this is just an incredible add-on tool to uh, this patch clamp technique. It's also used to study the function of entire populations. So by using these light activated channels, you can activate any population of neurons of choice and by activating them, then you can study the behavior and see how the function of this neuron um, changes any given behavior. I mainly use it to look at the synaptic connectivity. So my day to day would be um, cutting sections from a mice. So the mice is fully anesthetized and you cut about 300 micron sections. Um, and in those sections, you have neurons but you also still have these synaptic contacts that can be long range because um, you no longer need the cell body in your section to actually be able to record what kind of transmitters it releases. So I've got a video here that I made for a high school students a while ago where this is the patch pipette and this gray bit is the top of a mouse brain cortical section with on the top you basically see a lot of debris so when you cut the section the top layer will just contain dead cell material but as you focus more deeper in the slice you can see some neurons appear And you can see the pipette going in. And you basically see layer upon layer stacked here. And you can see apical dendrites here. So these are pyramidal neurons. And these neurons will stay alive for a whole day. So you can record lifetime how neurons communicate with each other. And the way you control this is like a joystick kind of way. When I started doing this, I basically was playing video games, but way cooler. Okay, so how did I get to do this? Um, I guess it starts with my parents, right? Uh, so I was born and raised in the Netherlands, just like my dad, you know, the land of cheese. And my grandfather did wear wooden shoes. 
Uh, and my mom joked that the second I could walk, my dad took me onto the ice for ice skating. And that's really one of the things I do miss being in Brisbane. Um, so half of the Netherlands is below sea level and we have a lot of water. And when it gets really cold, if we're lucky enough, um, we get ice and we can ice skate, which is pretty cool. Um, so my dad had a hereditary form of macular degeneration, which made his life pretty hard. Um, he was a factory worker in a dog food factory. Uh, he had saved all his money and he decided that he was going to travel to um, Central and South America with his best friend, Will. My mom is the oldest of 13. She was born and raised in rural Belize. Um, she got married. She had two kids. Then they immigrated to Chicago, to the United States, where they had more kids. Um, and then for reasons which is not my story to tell, she divorced. And while she was temporarily back in Belize with her four kids to visit her dad, she basically, you know, came across my dad. Um, and I guess they fell madly and deeply in love. Uh, and they knew this was quite an unusual situation. And I guess they had a discussion, where were they going to live? Um, and they decided that my mom and her four children were going to come to the Netherlands. And my mom had already said to my dad, look, if you're looking for someone to start a family, you know, you better keep walking because I have four kids and I don't really intend to have any more. Um, luckily, you know, I happened. So I'm quite happy to be um, a little accident. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. Um, so when I was born... I was born into this beautiful, big family, black family. Uh, my mom said that when I was a little baby, she hardly had any time with me because she said the second you would cry, someone would beat her to the crib to pick me up. So in these early years, I must have been absolutely loved to bits. Of course, I can't really remember it. Um, but even though, you know, my family's really back growing up, uh, in a village in the Netherlands around that time meant that, you know, 99% of the population uh, was actually white. Um, then this slide, I struggled with the most, and it contains no science, uh, but I do really want to tell you my story. And for everyone here who is doing diversity, equity, and inclusion work, a big shout out to you, because I know it can be really emotional draining um, even I've had people ask me, you know, why do you have to join this Black in neuroscience community? Shouldn't it just be based on merit? Um, and all these conversations, I think, can be pretty exhausting. Um, so this is me when I was seven. My father had just died. So he one day went to work in the Netherlands. Most people cycle. So he cycled to work and he got hit by a car. and He didn't survive that. So now my mom was a single black mom in a white country and she had basically the decision to make, what was she gonna do? Uh, was she gonna go um, immigrate back to Chicago or go to Belize? Um, she decided that for me, it probably would have, it would be better to stay in the Netherlands. Um, and that's what she did. And I think she was right because the education system in the Netherlands is really very good. Um, uh, but of course, uh, it wasn't easy when it comes to school, you know, it was pretty obvious to me and my teachers that I wasn't very smart. Now, I didn't do incredibly bad, but I definitely wasn't one of the, you know, bright, promising kids in the class. And, you know, teachers would make kind of jokes about me that I would be the absent-minded kid that when I had to redo a assignment I would end up ripping the new one and unawarely handing the old one in again but now looking at this little girl I am so proud of her because you know she went through a lot so I actually think you know my head not being in the game was maybe even a protective um, mechanism um and if it was up to my teachers, I probably wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't have gone to a high school that would allow me to go to university. But I always had my mom nudging me and basically saying, you know, just try, just try. And I did. And I ended up going to university. I didn't find university um, that difficult, but I'd already told myself and felt that, you know, teachers had told myself that that's just not 
wasn't for me. I basically wasn't smart enough. Um, and, you know, it kind of led to imposter syndrome where I really felt like people are going to find out that I don't belong here. And um, I think the data is pretty clear on imposter syndrome and minorities, like the prevalence is just a lot higher. And then last year, I'm sure many of you seen this incredible article. It was just such a breath of fresh air because when you usually read stuff about imposter syndrome, they're kind of doubling down on us saying, you know, that's really, you know, something that's wrong with you and that you need to solve. And this article basically says, you know, you feel exactly how you're meant to feel when you're in an environment that doesn't reflect you and even can be hostile towards you. Of course, you're going to feel like you don't belong. Um, so if you haven't seen this, I would definitely say give it a read. And then, you know, my story also doesn't end with me. I have two incredible daughters and I'm really hoping that communities like these and resources written by these two amazing women is really going to help them in their journey. Um, so there's also white male heroes absolutely in this story besides my mom um, because after my bachelor where I um, did some lab work trying to block the glycolytic pathway of a parasite um, I did a master's in biomedical science and my first course was neuroscience and like most of you here I was just blown away by both how little we know and just how amazing everything about the brain is. Um, so I did an internship at the department led by Arjen Broussard. And these men have really been instrumental. It wasn't just that they were there and they offered me a place. They were really incredibly um, encouraging to me. And so this is where I started patching. This is really where my love for patching began. The first internship I did with Arjen van Oya, who is a computational neuroscientist, because I thought after lab work, I should try something different. So I did a little bit of modeling with Neuro and MATLAB, and I decided I really didn't like doing that. Um, but Nail, at the time, um, he was um, part of the patch clamping team, and he said, why don't you, for your next internship, actually look at the real live communication between these two cells instead of just modeling it. Um, so I started doing that. So this is a picture from my rig here at the Queensland Brain Institute. So this is where your sections go. This is where you put your pipette. And then this is a way uh, of controlling the pipette. Uh, so I did that and I made paired recordings in the somatosensory cortex. Um, so I think less than 20%, maybe even 10% are these fast spiking into neurons. Um, and they're not that easy to find. And then most of them are pyramidal cells. And then the connectivity between those is also less than 20%. So the chance of finding a connection by patching two random cells is pretty big. But I just was so fascinated by the fact that we could keep these neurons alive. You can look at spontaneous activity. And then when you do get a pair, it's absolutely amazing. So you, you fire, you depolarize this cell and you decide how many action potentials it fires, depending on your intervals and uh, stimulation intensity. And then you just listen and you see how this other neuron responds to this input. And then we were really interested in the role of benzodiazepines because we know that these inhibitory inputs are changed by sleep medication. And then one day while I was, you know, happily patching away, Nail asked me, so are you going to do a PhD? And I'm like, of course not. I could never do a PhD. And he said, why not? And then I kind of didn't know what to say because I had just told myself I'd already basically outgrown any expectation anyone's ever had of me. Like, how do you mean do a PhD? So, you know, he was really encouraging. And then Arjen Broussard suggested that I apply for a PhD student at the FU Medical Center with Mario from the CNAP. So she was looking for a PhD student to work on this disease with this horrible name, megaencephalic leukoencephalopathy with subcortical cysts. So this is a childhood white matter disorder. And early 
uh, in childhood years from birth, basically the child's head gets bigger. Um, and then when you look on the MRI, so these are T2 weighted images where the white matter is black, the gray matter is gray, and then the ventricles with water is white. And you can see here that the gyres are widened and that there's really diffuse uh, white matter happening here. And then in this picture, you can see that there are some subcortical cysts. So these children really had a imbalance in their water homeostasis. So when you zoom into the brain, there's vacuoles. There's not just subcortical cysts, but the myelin's really swollen and there's like big bubbles within the myelin. And then later we discovered that in astrocytes, we also see some vacuoles close to um, the blood vessels. So she found, her group found the first gene, uh, which 75% of people had mutations in the MLC1 gene. Now, this gene coded for a protein of unknown function. So even though they had found the gene um, and knew what it would code for, they didn't know what it did. So Ilya, who was the predecessor on the project, um, had some initial data showing that this protein might be an ion channel. So they were really looking for someone to do more patch experiments. And that's basically what I had been doing. So this protein is natively expressed in astrocytes. So in humans, they're expressed in astrocytes. And then the mutation in these, this astrocytic protein basically causes this imbalance in, homo, in water homeostasis, but we didn't know how. So I patched a wide range of cells, uh, overexpression, knockdown experiments. So I think most people here will be familiar with the human embryonic kidney cell line. So this is a vertebrate cell line. And initially I was overexpressing the protein um, in those cells, but slowly over time, our negative controls stopped being negative. Uh, and we figured out because it is a vertebrae cell line, depending on what serum you culture them on, they will just start expressing MLC1. Um, so part of the Institute, a different neuroscience department, we're using these SF9 insect cells. So these are not vertebrate cells. They were using them for recombinant protein expression. Um, but I figured, you know, why don't I just try and patch them? And I did, and those experiments turned out really nice and we no longer had to worry basically whether or not our um, culturing method would cause any native expression. Then we had a cell line which were immortalized lymphocytes from patients, which was great because there was very low expression in these cells as well. And these were basically the only patient cells that we would have have access to. And then because the protein is natively expressed in astrocytes, I patched a lot of primary astrocytes as well. And we figured out that if you hyposhock these cells, so you expose them to a hypotonic solution, or you change their shape a little bit, so astrocytes tend to basically hug the cover slip, they get really flat. But if you mildly trypsinize them and they shrink in, these currents become a lot bigger. So these currents really um, are involved in volume, volume regulation. Um, so here the blue and the black bar are the control experiments. And then you get, you know, about a thousand picoamps of chloride currents. So the currents uh, were also very specific for chloride. Um, I've got the data where we showed that there's no change in potassium. Um, if you knock down, so you reduce the amount of MLC in these primary cultures by using silencing RNA, you get a reduction of the current. And then you overexpress the protein, you get an increase. Uh, so it was pretty clear that the MLC1 was involved in volume regulated chloride currents. Now it took me six years to complete my PhD. Uh, so some people might think, oh, man, why would anyone ever wanna go to the Netherlands to do a PhD? Well, there's a few reasons. Um, so yeah, six years is really not that unusual. There are definitely people who manage to finish within um, four years and quite a few who do it within five. 
Um, but basically, if you end up doing it in six, that's really not out of the ordinary. But one of the advantages of doing your PhD in the Netherlands is you're not really considered a student. Um, so I think what you get paid is more than you would get paid in many other countries. And you also get paid into like your pension fund, you build up unemployment money. And then, of course, if you're doing it for six years, you end up uh, way more likely to get some publications in high impact journals. Um, so this was the paper which mainly contained the patch data that showed that MLC1 is involved in volume regulated chloride currents and cell volume regulation. Um, but we also, I also did some experiments where we hyposhocked cells and actually looked at their volume. So these lymphoblasts of patients and controls show that if you put them in a hypotonic solutions, they will automatically swell because water will flow into the cell. But then these cells will activate their volume regulating mechanisms and they will basically go back to normal size and sometimes even overshoot. But you can see that the patient cells aren't as good at doing this. Uh, and then in astrocytes, when you knock down the native MLC, they become less efficient in regulating their volume. And then this can be rescued by adding wild type MLC on top. And then in the time that I was there, we found a second gene that codes for MLC. So only 75% of patients had um, mutations in their MLC1 gene. Now, even though we didn't find, um, even though we didn't know exactly what the function was and we still don't have good therapeutic intervention, it is very meaningful to families and these children to know um, what kind of disease they have. Because often when parents have sick children and they don't know what's wrong, they will go doctor to doctor, you know, if possible, they will travel to other countries because, of course, we want to know what's wrong. And if you might think that someone might know what it is, you're not going to stop looking. So even telling patients, you know, you have a mutation in this gene, um, it means they have some clarity and it also means they can have, you know, prenatal diagnosis for future family planning. So gliocam was the second gene. So now you know, 99% of MLC patients had a gene ascribed uh, to them. This was published as shared first author in the American Journal of Human Genetics. Um, and then what was interesting is that these patients developed a large head, um, you know, pretty straight after birth, but that their head stopped getting bigger after a few years. So we really wondered why that was. Um, and I showed that MLC expression is basically very high in the developing brain and that, you know, the expression reduces um, in time, um, which suggests that this protein is indeed important in the early years. And this was published as part of a bigger paper uh, for Mohid, who followed me when I left uh, and continued the MLC research. And then in the Netherlands, you have to do a public thesis defense. Um, so you have to stand on the stage and you have to defend um, your thesis in front of your committee. Your family and friends are all in the audience. And looking at these pictures, I look pretty confident here. But honestly, I was so scared and... You know, I thought someone would stand up and point to me and say, she doesn't belong here. She does not, you know, she shouldn't get a PhD. And now thinking about it, that's just ridiculous because I worked hard for six years and, you know, we had some incredible data, but I, I literally broke out in a rash a day before having to give this presentation. That's how stressed I was. Then this is me, probably one of the best beers I've ever had in my life. This was afterward. This is my mom who was living in Chicago and my oldest sister, um, my dad's oldest sister. And this is Lawrence, my significant other. Um, and in the Netherlands, in a lot of places, when you print your thesis, you will have like double space, single printed. In the Netherlands, we do the opposite and we make this really small, quirky, 
pieces where people, you know, design their own front covers. So then it was time to do a postdoc. So Lawrence, who's from the UK, basically said, let's go somewhere. I've had enough of the Netherlands. Um, and I also wanted to go somewhere because, you know, most people do. And that's really a great thing about science that you get to move around um, and, you know, be part of different science communities around the world. So I really missed working with neurons. So even though I'd patched a wide range of cells, I really wanted to look at cells who fire action potentials and have all these beautiful synaptic inputs. And then the second thing is I wanted to go somewhere warm and sunny. Um, so, you know, the Netherlands is a Northern European country. And if you like beach and warm weather, that's probably not the place to be. So I found the Synaptic Plasticity Lab at the Queensland Brain Institute uh, run by Pankaj Sa, and that's where I ended up. I emailed him. Uh, we had a really nice interview. So he's really one of the early adopters of the patch clamp technique. So when he started, there was no software for it. Like he had to write his own software. Uh, and he decided that he was going to focus on the amygdala and the role in fear. Um, so he's been looking at these circuits ever since, you know, he started and a lot of people in the lab still work on fear. And um, one of the really cool things I um, looked forward to is working with these optogenetic tools. So he was really just getting that started in his lab. And when you combine those optogenetic tools with transgenic mice, you can really specifically um, look at these uh, populations of interest combined with the patch clamped electrophysiology. So I did also apply to some jobs in the US and you can imagine because I had these great papers, people were actually quite keen to have me, uh, but I had heard some horror stories and some of the emails I'd got back just weren't really friendly. Um, it basically said, if you're not willing to work seven days a week, then there's no point coming here. Uh, and as you can imagine, most people, I was tired after my PhD. I was, you know, absolutely exhausted. Um, so I did not want to go somewhere for a few years to work seven days a week. Um, even though if I had, I would probably have my own lab by now. But I think life's about package deals and you really need to figure out what is right for you. Um, so I know a lot of people ha haven't heard of Brisbane. When I first um, applied, I was telling people I was going to Brisbane, uh, but here it's pronounced Brisbane and Australia itself is just really, really big. Uh, a friend of mine said he once caught a conversation of a couple from the US at the airport in Sydney who were there for two weeks who were saying they were going to rent a car and drive to Perth because it was just on the other side of the island, which of course um, I'm sure they did not end up doing because it will take you more than that time. And then we have a multi-talented postdoc who's taken some beautiful pictures. So this is from Stradbroke Island, which is really close to Brisbane. And this is the city Brisbane by night. And then Brisbane is really a subtropical climate. So it was exactly what I was looking for. And this is a picture of the Queensland Brain Institute. So I was dreaming, and my partner as well, that we would go to Brisbane, we'd learn how to surf, we'd grow pineapples. Unfortunately, we never learned how to surf, but we did grow our own pineapple. And growing pineapples is a bit like science in papers. It takes a long time. This pineapple took three years to grow. Uh, and I decided it should be, you know, used for something magnificent. So it was time for our lab Christmas party and I made pina coladas with it. Now I'd like to take you over, um, show you some of the data that I've been working with very recent, uh, working on very recently. Um, and it's about the neuro circuits of movement. And we're particularly interested in those in relationships to Parkinson's and freezing of gait. So Parkinson's disease is characterized by rigidity, uh, spasticity, 
and it's considered a dopaminergic degenerative disorder. So what happens is dopaminergic neurons in the substantia nigra pars compacta, which is part of the basal ganglia, they die, which leads to excessive inhibition of midbrain and thalamic uh, regions. So the mainstay treatment are dopamine agonists. So you're basically replacing the dopamine that had been lost by these dopaminergic neurons dying. And then deep brain stimulation of some of these basal ganglia area is also effective. Later in the disease, there are other neurons that also degenerate. And one of those is uh, thought to be cholinergic neurons in the pedunculopontine nucleus. So late symptoms include freezing of gait and patients describe this as being glued to the ground. Um, so they're walking along and then often something will change. So they need to walk through a door or walk out the elevator and their whole body moves, but their foot doesn't. And this really leads often to very serious injuries and falls, which then accelerates uh, the disease process. So this freezing of gait is insensitive to these dopamine agonists. Um, what is effective sometimes, um, kind of depending on the neurosurgeons, there's paper out there saying that deep brain stimulation of the PPN uh, is effective for freezing of gait, but others say it is not. Um, and this is not really strange because the PPN, it's not very well delineated. Um, so people aren't even quite sure exactly where the PPN begins and where it ends. And then it's also not a homogeneous structure. So it contains glutamatergic, GABAergic, and cholinergic neurons. Um, and freezing of gait is also not quite sure what's happening in the brain. So it's associated with a deficient in cognition and motor planning. So unraveling the neural circuits involved in motor initiation is essential in understanding the role of PPN in freezing of gait. So what do we know about this region, the pedunculopontine nucleus? Well, early experiments um, in cats showed that if you decerebrated cats, showed that if you put a stimulation electrode in there, you can get them to walk. And if you increase the intensity and frequency of the stimulation, you can get them to run. Uh, more recent experiments have shown that there's glutamatergic descending neurons um, that can mediate this effect. Then um, Punkage has a collaboration with neurosurgeons here at the hospital in St. Andrew, where they do deep brain stimulation for freezing of gait in these Parkinson's disease patients. Now, before they implant the electrodes for stimulating, they record as they go down. So Tim, a PhD student, was working on that, and he was measuring from these neurons in the PPN. And what they did is they asked the patients who were not moving to imagine moving, to just close their eyes and imagine walking. And what happened is that um, these neurons in the PPN responded. So some responded by increasing their activity, and some uh, responded by decreasing their activity. And then over the years, many people have done tracing studies where they put uh, markers into the PPN that either get retrogradely or integradely taken up. And it seems like there's many possible connections there. Uh, not many people have looked at the synaptic connections. So what type of PPN neurons project and how strong these projections are is not known for many of these regions. So paradoxical kinesis is the ability to perform a task that you were previously not able to do. Um, so there's stories of Parkinson's disease patients who haven't been able to walk for a while, um, but when they get caught in a house fire, they're e able to walk or even run out of the house. But then the second they're out of the house, they can no longer walk. So here is a video of a patient with Parkinson's disease who's really struggling to walk. So you can see him shuffling along. And now there are visual cues on the floor and see what an incredible difference that makes. And then after the cues are gone, at some point he really struggles to walk again. 
And, you know, the paradoxical kinesis and videos like this, I think make it pretty clear that when we're talking about motor circuits, there's not a single motor circuits, there are multiple parallel motor circuits going on. And if we can figure out these circuits, we might be able to activate one when another one isn't functional because of degeneration. So are self and Q triggered movements initiations mediated by different pathways? And this really started off as a collaboration between us and Carl Svoboda and Hida Inagaki. So they've been working on this motor planning for a long time and they've developed um, a task in mouse called the delayed response task. And they'd shown that during motor planning, there is this recurrent activity going on between the motor cortex and the thalamus. So these structures are bi-directionally connected. And during planning, um, basically information is maintained here by um, this recurrent activity. So the task is as following. Mice are trained to lick either right or lick left depending on which whisker is touched by a pole. But then they have to wait and they have to remember. And after a delay, an auditory cue will be played. And only after that cue are they allowed to lick. And of course they're rewarded for this. And during this delay period, that's when this recurrent activity happens. Now, what they wanted to know is which area triggers the change from motor planning to motor command? So where is this cue coming from? And in order to figure it out, what they did is they used neuropix and silicon probes in many brain areas, and they just recorded from cells and just looked at the delay of the response. So the nucleus of the lateral lemniscus is one that responds really early after the cue. And that's because this uh, gets input from the cochlear nucleus. So the auditory cue gets uh, reaches here pretty quick. And then the second area that pops up is the PPN and the MRN. Um, so they, they thought there's a good chance that um, the uh, PPN might convert the cue that leads that transfers motor planning into motor command. And that's where they contacted us because they knew that Punkage was working on the PPN um, and that we look at you know, synaptic connectivity and long range projections. Um, and basically to uh, prove what we did for our cell paper uh, is shown that if you now activate PPN neurons that project to the thalamus, you can actually get the animal to lick. So optogenetic stimulation of the PPN ascending motor thalamic pathway can trigger cue activated licking without the cue. So no longer playing the cue, but just shining the light with these neurons um, that contain channelrhodopsin gets the licking, gets the animal to uh, lick. And then for the follow-up paper, uh, what I'm doing is I really want to know and have a look at the synaptic connectivity between the PPN and this motor thalamic region um, and whether or not the cells that indeed go on to project to the ALM directly receive input. So in order to do that, I use a retrograde AAV to label ALM projecting ventral medial neurons in red and then I want to put channel rhodopsin specifically in those PPN neurons that project to the ventral medial. So I inject a retrograde CRE into the ventral medial that gets taken up by the PPN. And then when I add a CRE dependent uh, channel rhodopsin into the PPN, I will get cells in the PPN that project to the ventral medial. So that's the injection side of the ALM. And then what you get is you get axons coming from the PPN to the ventral medial and you get ALM projecting ventral medial cells. 
And then there's a second area, which I won't focus on that much today, that also gets input from the PPN and projects to the ALM. So taking this to my rig and doing some patch clamp recordings. So here again, you see the green cells now that project to the ALM from the ventral medial. And here you see all the fibers coming in from the PPN. Um, I record responses. So yes, cells that project to the ALM get input from the PPN. And some of those inputs are strong enough to um, evoke action potentials. And that these currents are as previously shown in our cell paper, they are indeed glutamatergic. And then what I'm also interested in is um, some microscopy work to just visualize where those synapses are located. So synapses can be on somas, they can be on axons, they can be on dendrites, and then the dendrite structure, they can be on apical or distal dendrites. So we found this cell paper that uses enhanced green fluorescent protein reconstruction across synaptic partner. What basically happens is you cut your fluorophore in half, you put half of it postsynaptic and you put half of it presynaptic, and then only at those synaptic contacts where the pre and post synapse combined will you get fluorescence. Um, so again, this involves doing injections and because we really wanted to look where the synapses on these ALM projecting motor thalamic neurons were located. Um, we injected retrocre in the ALM, a Cree-dependent post-grasp with some RFP to label those cells, and then the yellow pre-grasp into the PPN. And then you get really nice images like these. So this is a ventral medial neuron where you can see here in the blow up. So all these yellow dots are um, synaptic contacts coming from the PPN onto the thalamus. And then this is an example of a medial dorsal neuron. Um, and then another thing that we wanted to know, as I mentioned earlier, the PPN isn't very well delineated. Um, and it's important that we know exactly anatomically where these projection neurons are located. And this is in collaboration collaboration with Chip, who's been amazing. So what he does after you've injected, cut your brain, um, he's found a way to put it all neatly, nicely back together and do a whole brain reconstruction. So this is one of our brains that I injected uh, into the ventral medial. So this is the injection site. And then this is a cluster of cells in the PPN. So the ventral medial has bi-directional connections to this ALM. So we also see uh, lots of cells labeled in this region because when you inject the retrograde AAV, any region in the brain that projects to this region will basically have their cells um, filled with green fluorescence. So this is done using the NeuroInfo software. And um, this is a combination of four brains that were specifically injected in the VM. And you can see that the injection site is pretty nicely um, contained to the VM and that it spans most of the VM. So the most posterior section, uh, there's not a lot of labeling and neither is the anterior. So now we can go into the PPN and have a look where those cells are actually located. So the outlines here this is where the Allen Atlas um, puts the PPN. So this is all PPN region. Uh, this section no longer has PPN, but it will have a bit of MRN. Uh, but what you can see is that these cells are not you know, randomly distributed within the PPN. They are really located more medial in the posterior slices of the PPN. And that brings us to the summary for this part. So neural circuit of motor initiation. Um, so it's pretty clear uh, from the data that the PPA conveys the cue to initiate movement. And that glutamatergic neurons in the PPN can drive thalamic neurons that project to motor cortical regions, um, that they are located in the medial posterior part of the PPN and they mainly form dendritic synapses. So this now, is a basal ganglia independent neurocircuit of Q-triggered motor initiation. 
And why is this um, so amazing? It's because with Parkinson's, we know that the main degeneration happens in the basal ganglia. And if you know, we can find ways of activating pathways that do not have as much degeneration, this can end up really um, being a, a way of um, getting some of the locomotion back. Um, so of course, there's still a lot to be done. And um, one of the things would be good to see whether optogenetic manipulation of these neurons actually change gait in PD mice models. And then I've been supervising a PhD student, Taisha, who's just submitted her thesis. It took her only three years. Um, she's done really amazing through COVID. And she's done lots of experiments because the PPN also connects to the um, substantia nigra pars reticulata. Um, and has she has shown that it's involved in um, movement as well. But that's her story to tell for another time. So which neurons and pathways are responsible for self-initiated movement? So we've shown the one for Q-initiated, um, but really, you know, all those pathways are, of course, very worth looking at and figuring out. Uh, and then personally, I'm, you know, really interested in this PPN. And as I said, it has glutamatergic, GABAergic, cholinergic neurons. Um, I'm interested in the local circuitry and uh, looking into the other long-range projections of this nucleus. Then some of this really early data I got to present at SFN 2019 in Chicago. We're all happy, completely unaware how COVID's gonna, you know, change our way of life. Uh, and my mother and two sisters live in Chicago, so it really gave me a chance to catch up catch up with friends. And then the big thing was my nephew, who I hadn't seen in eight years. And as you can tell, he's basically completely outgrown me and now has changed into a man. Finally, for the last bit of my talk, um, can we use these tools to study connectivity to combat neurodegeneration? So with uh, neurodegeneration, uh, often, what you see in end stages, and this happens not just in motor neuron disease, but in Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease, is that there is excess excitability and that causes to an increase in calcium, which is toxic to the cell. Um, and we've been using all these tools to either excite or inhibit neurons. So halorhodopsin is the uh, optogenetic way, one of the optogenetic ways to increase chloride current and reduce the activity of cells. But there are also drug activated silencing receptors, these chemogenetic receptors, and the most famous ones are probably the dreads. So they will use a drug instead of light to activate these channels and um, in this case, cause inhibition and silencing. So motor neuron disease, um, which is the disease that we're trying to stop neurons degenerate, uh, is characterized by the selective death of motor neurons. So this is um, physicist Stephen Hawking, who passed away and who had motor neuron disease. He had a very rare form of the disease, though, because he lived uh, much longer than most patients. So most patients will die uh, within three to five years after diagnosis from respiratory failure. So the motor neurons are those neurons that, you know, enable us to breathe, speak, walk. Um, this is a spinal cord section of a mouse where these big purple cells are the motor neurons. So the cause is unknown and um, likely multifactorial, uh, but we know that this hyperexcitability and excited toxicity uh, really plays a part um, in these neurons dying. And the mainstay treatment for this disease hasn't changed in the last, I don't know, 40 years. Um, so Rilazole uh, reduces hyperexcitability by reducing glutamate, but it's quite toxic because it's really not specific and patients often have nausea um, and other symptoms. And the big thing is it's really not that effective. So 
even with this drug, their life expectancy only extends by a couple of months. Um, so what we've been trying to do is use uh, drug activated receptors um, to reduce the amount of excited toxicity. So what we try and do is we increase the chloride conductance to try and counterbalance this increase that we see in sodium and mainly calcium. Um, and what we need for that is a silencing receptor. So this is all unpublished. And unfortunately, we're not very close to getting it published either because these experiments take a long time and they're very expensive as well. So we really actually are trying to recruit more funding um, so we can continue this research. But if you're interested in collaborating, absolutely, um, just contact me. Um, but the, the overall idea is that we've got this chemogenetic receptor. Um, we put that in an AAV and then we have an FDA approved drugs, which we administer to activate these channels. So then we need a mouse model for MND. So the mouse model we've used so far is the SOD1 mice. So SOD1 mutations are seen in some people with familiar MLD. And we cross this line uh, with a chat free line. Now chat is expressed by cholinergic neurons and in the spinal cord, these are the motor neurons. So here in green, you see chat expressing motor neurons. Uh, so if we cross this motor neuron device with a chat Cree, we will get Cree expression in these motor neurons. So then when I inject the pups with a Cree dependent AAV of our receptor, we now just get expression of our receptor in these motor neurons. And this is some of our very promising most recent data. Um, and here you can see disease onset and survival. And you can see that the disease onset is delayed in the treated animals and that they survive longer. Um, so with these mice, you can do a lot. You can look at grip strength. Um, they can put them on a rotor rod where you see how well they're able to walk. Um, this is following weight. So sick animals will lose weight. So this is the same data, just plotted differently. So here we have normalized weight. So at 11 weeks was put on 100%. And then this is the age of the animal. And you can see that the age at which they start getting sick um, is much earlier in the non-treated animals compared to the treated animals. Now, when we started, these are not our initial experiments. We tried a lot of things. Um, and Elena and Jack um, have been students who've been helping me with this project over the years. And as you can see here, our original receptor didn't work. So we've changed the receptor and we've optimized it. But even then, when we put our drug in the drinking water, it doesn't really seem to do anything. So it's not until we have both our optimized receptor and we inject the drug IP um, that we get this big result. And what's really nice, if you look in the literature and you look at Rilazole, there's no difference in either onset or survival. So we know that in humans, this drug's not very effective and this small effect just doesn't even seem to pop up in this SOD1 um, mice when you treat these animals. So of course, um, we're hoping that the effect we're seeing um, as this translates to months in humans, that this might translate to uh, years. But of course, you can also see from these N numbers that there's still quite a lot of work to do. These are really just small numbers um, and we really need to um, increase that. And we're collaborating with two, um, two labs here at UQ, one at QBI, and um, we want to use one of uh, the TDP43 mouse, which is one of the mouse alliance atoms characterized, uh, because we want to show really that this silencing receptor and drug approach is not just effective in specifically motor neuron disease and SOD1 mice, but that it actually translates to a wider range of neurodegenerations that have different underlying causes. Um, and then the receptor we use 
um, changes the inhibitory synaptic transmission of these motor neurons. And I really like to patch more of those. Patching spinal cord motor neurons is really hard, um, but if you can do it, it's also pretty cool. And then we just want to do some more microscopy stuff where we really visualize the loss of motor neurons and hopefully how you have more motor neurons left in these treated animals. And that brings us to the end of this session. I'd like to thank the organizers again for giving me this opportunity. I'd like to thank the sponsors for making this possible. I'd like to thank everyone here. Um, I want to thank the lab. You know, I've been a postdoc in Punkage's lab for a really long time now, and it's really been an amazing time. I want to thank the lab manager, Petra, and everyone else in the lab who's just been great. And I know. You know, we often have these conversations about, you know, bringing your whole self to work. And I can say I really can bring my whole self to work. And I'm really grateful that I have an environment where we're, you know, genuinely really supportive to each other. And we know that we're humans first before researchers. So this is Punkage with my daughter when she was still a baby. We had a lab meal and I brought her along. And as you can see, she felt really comfortable and just fell asleep. And then maybe some of you've noticed since I was born in 1982 that I've turned 40 this year. Um, my colleagues literally made me cry. Marcin decorated my desk and we have this huge open plan office. So of course everyone knew I turned 40 and then they got me a cake with 40 and treated me to margaritas. So I feel absolutely loved. And I really also want to thank our collaborators because being part of that collaboration that amounted to this recent cell paper has really been great. Um, so Carl Svoboda, Hida, Nagaki and Chip Gerfen, like it's just amazing. And I'm honestly just happy that I get to be part of this science community. Okay, thank you, everyone. I'll stop sharing. Thank you so much, Dr. Ritter. If everyone can continue to give your rounds of applause, I see you guys giving your reactions. That was a wonderful talk. And thank you for your insights and your journey, such an interesting journey. Um, we do have one question so far, and if you have more questions, please put them in the Q&A chat. The first question says, thank you for your presentation. I didn't watch it at the beginning, but I'm wondering how this may improve Parkinson rodent model. Yeah, so if you have degeneration in the basal ganglia, um, we might be able to activate this basal ganglia independent pathway and you know get the mouse moving. Awesome. The next question says, may I ask, did you ever consider going into an industry position after completing your PhD? Um, I think throughout the years, I mean, funding, we all know in science isn't great. And I've really been on, you know, year by year contracts like many postdocs. So I think close to the end, yeah, I, I've um, considered it many times. I mean, I really, after my PhD, I really wanted to do a postdoc. Um, because I really wanted to be part of a science community somewhere else in the world because, yeah, I had such a nice experience um, that I really wanted to give that a go. And people tend to say, you know, you don't really lose out on your career if you do a two-year postdoc. It's just my postdoc turned out to be a lot longer. Um, <laughs> and, you know, there's a good chance with funding that I'll end up doing something else, that I won't be in neuroscience forever because we don't, you know, I've seen many of my very talented friends and colleagues who have left, not because they necessarily wanted to, but just because the funding ran out. Thank you for your honesty. Um, a next question we have is, thank you for your wonderful talk. What would you advise early scientist women who are thinking about starting a family and want to balance that with pushing their research career? That's a hard one, right? And I'm not sure anyone has the answer. And I will say that being here in Australia at the Queensland Brain Institute, I think 
really encouraged me to have a family. So we almost get six months of maternity leave. Had I been in the US, that would have been really different. So you need to have been in uh, in your job for a year, but after you've been here for a year, basically you get almost six months, which is really a lot. And I think if I had been in a different country, I might have not made that decision when I did. Uh, but it's hard. And I mean, the big thing is it's your partner. If you if you're a woman woman in science and you want to have kids, you need to have support. So if you're with a significant other who just says, look, if you want to have kids, then you're going to be looking after them, then that's going to be a real challenge. But, you know, my partner, he went back to working for only four days for the first few years when we had kids. So I continued um, full time work and basically he actually took a step back. So that made it easier for me to continue my research research uh, because realistically you know you just can't have it all and we need to be very mindful of our mental health as well and I think you know there's pushing boundaries but you also need to know when to yeah basically look after yourself you don't want to fall off that cliff by thinking you can do it all all the time that is a great answer and a perfect segue into our next question, which is, have you had any failures during your journey that helped you grow or that you learned from? Oh, uh, absolutely. So I think like everyone, like during my PhD, one thing I did, uh, I spent a whole year trying to purify this MLC1 protein. So what we really wanted to show is that this protein on its own is an ion channel. But in order to do that, you need to basically rip it out of the membrane and then put it back in an artificial membrane that now contains no other proteins. And then if you can measure a current over this membrane, you can say, yes, this is a channel. And for a year I tried and tried, you know, and tried. And then at some point uh, my supervisor said, okay, let's just throw money at it. We'll just get a company to do it. So we contacted two companies and the first company basically said, yeah, sure, we'll do it. This will cost you a lot of money and there's no guarantee that we'll actually give you anything. And the other company basically said, no way, we're not doing this. This is just impossible. And it kind of made us realize like, yeah, maybe we should have you know, looked into that a bit earlier. Um, and there's, yeah, there's many of those things where I could basically have saved years off my life. Um, but it's part of the journey, I guess. Yeah, definitely. We all have our journeys. Um, and in your journey, actually, you talked about your decisions to stay in the Netherlands or go to Australia. And do you have any advice for BIN members who may want to move to the Netherlands and Australia to study? Um, and how important is that diversity, equity, inclusion you discussed earlier on in your talk in these countries? Um, so both the Netherlands and Australia is pretty white. So, you know, you guys have a lot of great communities for black scientists and outside in the US. Uh, we don't have that. Um, so I don't know. I would say know what you want to do. And of course, you know, outside there's a lot of people and you know, most people are absolutely wonderful, but it's something you do want to think about. Um, and I'm here. So if you want to come to Australia, if you want to come to Brisbane and, you know, you just want to have a friendly place or just have coffee, feel free to contact me. Um, and also, if you want more information about the Netherlands, and I mean, like I studied in Amsterdam and Amsterdam is wonderful. And, you know, most science communities are very diverse even if you look at the lab picture that i just showed like we have people from all over the world uh, but it's kind of when you go outside our little science bubble like i wouldn't just move anywhere like i love the countryside i love animals but i've chosen to basically live in a place where quite a lot of parents basically were born outside of australia just to really make sure that my kids have a diverse environment um, I hope that answers the question. 
<laughs> yes. And we'll do one more question. If you have other questions, Dr. Ritter has definitely said, please reach out to her. Um, so our last question will be, how do you balance your interest between basic and translational science? Um, that's also really hard. I mean, at the moment, the funding for the translational science basically has just run out. Um, so if someone has buckets of money, <laughs> I'm here. Um, and I really love the fundamental science, but equally, I feel, you know, the ultimate goal is to really improve patients' life. And we also need to not lose sight of, you know, what we're here for. And, you know, the development of these tools are happening so quickly. And it just makes sense to see if we can use them both for, you know, getting more information as well as using it as means of intervention for diseases. Yes. Well, if you have buckets of money, you heard Dr. Ritter. <laughs> but, well, I want to thank you so much, Dr. Ritter, for sharing your insights. And we are rooting for you and your success worldwide. Thank you, everyone, for coming. Thank you again to our conference sponsors and a big thanks to our live captioner and sign language interpreter. And as a reminder, this and all of our events will be available on the YouTube page. And if you haven't yet, please join the conversation on social media and continue the conversation with Dr. Ritter. Um, definitely please contact her for collaboration, buckets of money, or just the coffee to move to Australia. Well, we hope to see you at the rest of the events for the rest of the week. And I hope you have a wonderful day, evening, lunch, whatever it is after this. <laughs> Bye everyone.